Kyle Eschenroder, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me again, Brett. All right, so it was a few months ago, you wrote an ebook long treatise. And it wasn't a treatise. It was like these pithy meditations full of just awesome actionable information. It was called The Meditations on the Wisdom of Action. And you took sort of these 116 or so ideas about action and fleshed it out. But here's the thing. It was really popular. Got a lot of great feedback from it. Similar to the other content you've published on the site about, you know, not hacking your life. You've also written about action before, but this one you fleshed it out some more. And what's interesting about your take on action, it's not this sort of raw, raw, like motivation, Instagram meme, like I'm going to take over the world type action, but it's more of a lens by which to see the world, you know, a posture you take. So it's, I mean, it's like really a ph- philosophical look at life where it involves around action. So how is action its own prism in philosophy? Yeah, this is probably one of me my favorite question because a lot of people read it and they kind of take it as this, like you said, an exhortation, just me yelling about doing more stuff, take action, take action, take action. When in fact, what it is, is a description of action as closely as I could kind of witness it. So what happened is I consumed a ton of those kind of rah-rah blog posts and books that are just yelling at you to take action, take action, just do it. You know, it's all just an extension of just do it. But I kind of got exhausted from that. Like, you know, that kind of stuff might get me pumped for a day. Then I got exhausted and then eventually kind of embarrassing to me. So like you said, I wanted to actually look at the world through action, see if it's a worthwhile goal. So where I started from is I took, you know, what happens when I take action and I try to look at it as closely as possible to understand it as closely as possible. And after working through this for a while, the more I understood action the easier it became to take more bold actions, take action more consistently. But then I think even more important, and what I was not expecting was that I was more discerning in my action, right? Because when we talk about taking action, we're not using a dictionary definition because that's just everything we do, right? What we're talking about is taking right action, doing the things we know we want to do, but kind of are held back by, you know, maybe... Stephen Pressfield's resistance or some other kind of internal or external force pushing against us. So you become more discerning in the actions you take when you understand the nature of action. And when you understand the nature of action, it also becomes easy to take the actions you know you should. So that was a long (laughs) way of getting to the core idea, which is, you know, the lens of taking action is essentially prioritizing reality over stories about reality. So that is also prioritizing execution over explainable understandings of the world. So an example of that is, you know, we can walk more efficiently when we're not thinking about how we're walking. If somebody says, wow, you're walking funny, you're definitely going to start walking funny because you start trying to understand it. You start trying to consciously bring to your consciousness something that you do automatically really, really well. So the implications of prioritizing reality over our stories about reality mean that we put our relationship to reality ahead of measuring reality. We put what's important to us over what others tell us should be important. We put predictions and commitments ahead of justifications and explanations and Again, we actually, Nassim Taleb puts it, puts it really, really well. He says, suckers try to win arguments, non-suckers try to win. So again, overall, the prism is that everything flows from prioritizing action over explanation. Gotcha. So read less blog posts, business books, and spend more time just doing stuff that you're reading about. Right. Yeah, exactly. If you read a how-to book, You're going to feel like you're learning how to do something when you probably would have learned more and gotten further if you actually tried doing that thing. Right. And I thought it's interesting too, like, you know, this sort of this definition you have of action, it's not sort of the, this typical definition. 
it also the way you argue in your the article that action can also mean being passive sometimes, but like but like passive in an active way, if that makes sense, like deliberately being passive, right? That's that can be action as well, right? Yeah, and I think in the book I use the example of the Spartans, like Spartan warriors were kind of known for waiting for the other army to come charging at them, lose their composure and basically start flailing around. Things that we would traditionally see as action when in fact they were just losing control of themselves. Whereas the Spartans were waiting as an action. So if we're waiting out of fear or out of laziness, you know, that's inaction. That's something that works against us while waiting attentively, waiting for a certain moment is one of the most powerful moments we can take. A more modern example is Warren Buffett. He makes investment moves very, very rarely. He's always waiting, always watching, always attentive to find the most powerful, most leveraged move he can make. So he's actively waiting. He's not waiting because he's fearful of the markets or he's, he's scared. He's waiting to pounce kind of thing. Right. Well, speaking of inaction, right? So there's a type of an inaction that can be productive, right, in the case of Warren Buffett or the Spartans. But there's also an inaction that you say that, you say inaction is expensive. Why is inaction expensive? And why don't we often realize it's the cost of not taking action? So this is, I think, another key. So when we take action, the costs are immediate and obvious. So the rejection we might face, the failure we might have to accept, the money we might lose. All those things are immediately painful and they're very obvious to us, very measurable. And the, while the benefits of action are delayed, so the growth, the virility, the progress, the learning are often come later. So with inaction, it's reversed, right? So in action, costs are immediate, benefits are delayed. With inaction, costs are delayed and benefits are immediate. Benefits primarily being comfort, right? So if we decide on inaction, we feel better right away, and then later the costs come. And not only are the costs delayed, they're also kind of hard to measure. So the costs of inaction tend to be like decay, depression, and our life generally gets smaller. It's hard to define, but we become smaller when we choose inaction too often, right? And this plays great to a couple things. Our need for instant gratification, right? So we get the comfort right away, whereas action, we have to put in cost right away. And it also plays to, you know, what gets measured gets managed. We can measure the costs of action. It's very difficult to measure the costs of inaction, but they're undeniable once they've had some time to compound your life is just, you know, like you said, it's, uh, smaller, no virility. Yeah, so it's kind of this slow, gradual descent that, that makes it very difficult to see day to day, but year over year, it's painfully obvious. Right. So in action, the benefits are immediate. So that's hard to get over, though, because oftentimes you have this line in your book. And so just for people to know, we actually took Kyle's thing he wrote. I don't, it's like a, it's, not a, it's not a post because it's too long to be a post. Uh, <laughs> But it's like an ebook. We made it an actual book. We called it The Pocket Guide to Action. And it's available for pre order. It's fantastic. I love flipping through it. We'll put a link in the site. One of my favorite lines in The Pocket Guide to Action is this It's, I don't feel like working out until I get my blood flowing. I'm too tired to have sex until we've begun. I don't want to go to the party until I'm there. Motivation will follow you if you have the balls to go without them. And it's true. Like we've, I think we talked about this last time when you were on. We talked about action. The thing about action is that, like, you usually don't feel like, doing the thing that you know you need to do until you start doing it. So th- that's the question though, is like, how do you bootstrap that, right? How do you get yourself to do the thing you know you need to do that you don't feel like doing, but you know you're going to start feel like doing it once you start doing it? I mean, so how do you take that first step? I think that's what holds a lot of people back. People know they need to work out and they know once they start working out, it's not going to be so bad and they're going to enjoy it but they just, they don't feel like working out at that moment. Is it, is it just brute force discipline or do you have psychological ideas that can help you get over that hump or beat that resistance? Yeah. So I think there's a million little tricks for this. I 
personally have to avoid relying on brute force discipline <laughs> just because I don't feel like I'm incredibly disciplined. So I mostly have to trick myself into doing something. And and really it's whatever works for you. There's like, you know, this is one of those things, there's a million blog posts out there and they all give you like a little trick to get going. I think just trusting in the quote that you just read, like trusting that once you start, you'll like it, you'll, you know, you'll gain momentum. I think knowing that, and it takes a little leap of faith each time, but just knowing that helps get the ball rolling. But probably the most consistently effective tactic that I use is to trick myself into kind of minuscule steps towards the thing. So something that I'm, I'm doing right now is getting back into cold showers. And it's almost impossible for me to talk myself into getting into a cold shower because it's just so uncomfortable right away, right? It, it immediately puts my body into shock. It's like, it's not fun for the first 30 seconds at all. So while my mind is running all these like negative things and like trying to, you know, making me flinch away from the water, I'm taking kind of rebellious, tiny steps in the direction that I decided on, which is, you know, cold shower. So I'm turning on the water and I'm making it cold. I'm opening up the door. And each time I'm not committing to taking the shower. I'm just committing to a tiny step towards the thing. So then finally I'm there, you know, nude in front of a cold shower. And, you know, what am I going to do? Now I have to retreat. It, now it takes more effort for me to turn on the hot water and I feel bad about myself, right? So you get yourself set up so retreat feels bad. The same thing, another example, you know, going to the gym, right? So if I'm just getting back into the habit of going to the gym, then I have to just put on my gym clothes or just show up at the gym, right? And because once I'm there, I'm going to feel really guilty if I just walk in and walk out. So I just commit to the tiniest, easiest possible thing that might have a chance at making me feel guilty for not doing the right thing. And I think, you know, both of those things, like working out and taking cold showers, once you do it, then you're, you're like amazed <laughs> that you ever had any kind of aversion to that thing. But of course, like at the gym, you're literally ripping your muscles apart. So it's not pleasant if you're not used to it. But once you, you know, get in the habit, then it feels great. So yeah, that's my, my biggest trick is just making, you know, lowering the bar so far that you can kind of roll over it. Right, right. No, that's, that's a great point. We've had Ramit Sadie on the podcast. He talks a lot about, you know, making micro, breaking down your goals into micro steps. Tim Ferriss talked about when you're trying to create a habit, if you're having a hard time with it, you probably need to redesign it. Like how you're approaching that usually means making the habit smaller. Yeah, a lot of great advice there. Okay. So you just said something when you were talking about action and your kind of approach to action, you talked a lot about the importance of experiencing things firsthand, right? Experience is the best teacher. And I'm a big believer in that. Like, I think the best way that I learn is when I get my hands dirty with something and mess up and learn from those mistakes, et cetera. But at the same time, and I know you are, a, you've read some Charlie Munger yourself. What I love about Charlie Munger is like, you know, he's a big believer in reading and you read so you can learn from the mistakes of others. So how do you balance that? How do you balance learning from experience yet at the same time reading from and learning from the mistakes of others so you don't commit those same mistakes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> it's so funny you mentioned Munger because the when you said the question, the first thing that I thought of was a quote from Charlie Munger that he likes to repeat. You know, and by the way, I, I don't know if you mentioned this, but Munger is Warren Buffett's kind of legendary investment partner that totally changed the way Buffett approached investing early on and allowed him to get as huge as he became. But he has, he, he has this thing that he's been repeating for decades. And he says, all I want to know is where I'm going to die. So I never go there. And that is, you know, some of the best advice you can get. Like you said, he's looking for mistakes other people have made so he doesn't have to make them. So, and I, and I do think that we can avoid, you know, avoiding terrible things is the best way to a good life. More than anything positive, it's kind of this via negativa approach to a good life is if you avoid doing all of the terrible things people do to make life worse, you're going to have a good life. So 
<laughs> at the same time, I believe that to really grok something, to, to really understand something deeply, you have to experience it. So I think what Munger is doing and what we're doing when we decide to avoid the mistakes of others is we just decide that we don't really need to understand everything, right? So if I'm avoiding, you know, if I could have avoided touching a hot stove when I was a kid, my mom told me and I trusted her and I could have avoided it, I would have avoided getting burnt once, but I would never have a true understanding of why. Like, what does it feel like to have your fingers burnt off? So I think when we go with this, it's just kind of, you have to, there's certain things that you don't want to understand all the way, you know? Um, so there's certain drugs that are so addictive. I, there's, you know, I don't need to know the experience of having that drug because I know it's going to end in a bad place. Now that doesn't mean I can have full empathy with people who have gone through addiction and, um, you know, suffered through these things, but I have a good enough understanding that I need to move forward and to make decisions in my own life. And so we can make, you know, we, we can avoid certain things, but I don't even think, you know, it, certain mistakes have huge consequences. Other mistakes are completely avoidable, but the cost of making certain mistakes is worth making a mistake. So in my example, let's say I, I used to trade money, right? I used to be a day trader. I used to run a small fund. So when I made the transition from paper trading to trading real money, there was no, you know, the theory was the same and most of the practice was the same, but the psychological effects were completely different. So I had to make a similar set of mistakes that I did with paper money, with real money. I had to lose real money to really understand what trading method I needed to use. And then the same thing happened when I started trading other people's money. So first I was trading mine. Then when I started trading other people's, it, you know, same, again, same theory, but whole new set of mistakes psychologically that happen when you're dealing with other people's money, right? So it's a different texture of same mistakes. And you need to make those mistakes. Like you need to lose money at least a little bit in order to not lose a ton later on, right? Does that make sense yeah. in this context? Okay. Uh, yeah, I think that makes sense. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's about being smart about certain things. Like there's like some things you just should just stay away from completely, but there's some things that you need to figure out on your own because that's the only way you're going to learn. It's, it's basically taking an Aristotelian approach. Like be smart about... Like, like make the right mistakes for the right reason, at the right time, right? That sort of moderation idea. Exactly. Yeah. It's like that Yogi Berra line. In theory, there's no difference between theory and practice, but in practice, there is, right? right? So you can have a great working map of your surroundings, but until you actually go and investigate the territory, you can't fully understand what the map is saying. So one of my favorite ideas you talk about in the book is that some actions have more leverage than others. So what does it mean for a certain action to have extra leverage? And what are some examples of that? I think b even before we go into them, you say the, these are actions that should be prioritized, right? And I, I consider leveraged actions to either automate or eliminate the need for future actions. So a couple types of actions that automate actions are creating habits, you know, and so that's, you know, habit of working out, the habit of meditating. It's something that you can do. It automates a habit. Another way is creating an environment, right? So if you shape your environment in a way that shapes future actions, you're essentially automating future actions. An example of this I used recently is my girlfriend and I were eating out quite a lot just because we, we weren't in the habit of cooking our own food for a while. And so to kind of ease us into cooking our own food, we subscribe to Blue Apron, right? So Blue Apron, we're paying for it. Food's going to get here for the week. And if we eat out too many times, then we're going to waste a bunch of food that we already have in the fridge. So that was a way of shaping our environment 
to shape and automate future actions. No, we're, we're fans of Blue Apron too. By the way, they, nice. are, they are a sponsor of the podcast. <laughs> oh, I had no idea. <laughs> but <they're laughs> so they, but just to know, you know, the, uh, Kyle, this was not like Kyle was not paid to blur this at all. It might just so happen no. that they, they are one of the, the sponsors on this episode. But I thought that was, but I, yeah, I love Blue Apron because it, you're right. It does create this habit of cooking when you don't have it. Right. Yeah. It makes it super easy. And then, you know, for us, we were on it for, you know, two months and then started going to the store and, and it was easy. Like it was easy to start cooking from total scratch. So th- those are two ways we can automate future actions, right? And then another great way to have a leveraged action is to eliminate future actions. You can do that with experiments. So if you set up an experiment, then you're paying attention to the results of a certain action or series of actions close enough that you're going to minimize repetition. So you won't have to do the same or, or similar actions over and over again because you know that that's not working, right? So another, another type of elimination would be like hiring in a business, right? If you have a set of, of tasks or whatever, you can eliminate future actions by, by hiring. Right. No, it's, it's a very Aristotelian approach. Mm-hmm. Aristotle was all about you create habits like you not only want to be able to not have to think about doing the thing like you're you're wanting to do but you want to make it even like to the get to the point where you enjoy it right like you actually enjoy yes. doing the thing and that takes work like it takes a lot of uh, psychological emotional and mental and sometimes physical work to get to that point amen yeah and, and but it's it's interesting it's again to me that goes back to you know delayed it's what do you want up front and what do you want later right so you want to want to do the hard thing but in order to do that you have to suffer through doing the hard thing when you don't want to do it you have to earn the right to want to do the hard thing. So another idea that I love was that right action is not reactive, it's proactive. And I like this thought because it's something I've thought about nearly every morning when I wake up and I look at my phone on my dresser and think of checking it and try to decide not to start the day in a reactive way, right? Where I'm like reacting to my phone. What are some other ways that we set ourselves up for making reactive decisions and why is that why is that so detrimental to us Mm -hmm. i think the example you gave is so perfect for outlining this idea in total so if you think about it you're waking up you're reaching over to this you know i don't even know just this source of information you have no idea what you even want from it you just want whatever's there and then you open it up and you start scrolling through twitter or i don't know what your your thing is instagram reddit so i my, mine are like reddit and twitter that's where i go to if i if my brain's turned off and i just want to be fed random stuff i go to twitter reddit and so you're starting the day asking for the world to tell you what to think right now, essentially, right? Instead of starting the day, you know, proactively doing the thing that you most need to get done today or thinking the thoughts that you most want to lead the day with, right? You're going for a total crapshoot just by opening up your phone first thing in the morning. So I think essentially, like, if we are taking a posture of action, part of that is being engaged enough with the thing that we're doing to know whether or not that's the thing we should be doing, right? (laughs) So having a priority, if you have a priority, if you're engaged in action, you're you're automatically proactive or at least will self-correct to being proactive. But a couple like very common examples of setting ourselves up for reactivity is, you know, checking your inbox with no purpose or outside of like a defined time frame. You know, if you, you know, finish a task, if you know you have a task to do, but then you open up your inbox for some reason just to see what's there, you're asking for other people to demand your time, right? Um, Again, super common, nothing interesting here. (laughs) Another one is surfing the web with no aim, right? So there's a thousand companies that are A-B testing headlines to capture your attention to essentially biologically force you to read their content and to trap you as long as they can with clickbait and whatever provocative headlines they have. So you're just setting yourself up for reactivity if you're just going to go surf the web. And not that surfing the web is a terrible thing. We should just be conscious of, okay, I am submitting myself to these forces, right? To me, the antidote for these things is 
just to ask myself, what's the best thing I can do right now? And if I'm trying to get entertained and I want to spend time on Reddit, then I'm there. But I also should know that I'm setting myself up for reactivity, right? The, the opposite would be, you know, the proactive use is I'm going to Reddit to get entertained or I'm reading this news story because I want to know this specific fact or if this specific thing is true, right? So that's a way of consuming as an act of action, right? It's conscious, we're engaged with it, it's purposeful. One thing I've been thinking about though lately is that it's it's hard, it takes a lot of mental bandwidth not to be reactive because it involves a lot of restraint. And you see your phone, you wanna grab it, you wanna check it, you have to restrain yourself from checking your phone. You have to like fight that urge. And one thing I've been thinking a lot about lately and it came up to mind while you were talking so a while back ago, I had Ian Bogost on the podcast. I don't know if you read his book, Play Anything. But he had this idea about constraint versus restraint. And he says we spend a lot of time restraining ourselves. And it just backfires because like we only have so much bandwidth, mental, emotional bandwidth of the day to say no to things. So instead of restraining ourselves, he argues for putting up constraints in our lives. And this kind of goes along with what you were saying about shaping your environment to make actions easier. So he says, instead of having to worry about restraining yourself, you offload that to your environment. So you have these constraints you have to work within. So that might mean you put some sort of blocker right on your smartphone where you can only check certain apps at certain time. So you no longer have to think about restraining yourself. You have that constraint there. If you go to check your phone at the not the right time, well, you can't check your thing. And it just it's amazing when I do that, whenever I put constraints in my life, how much smoother things go, how much more I get done compared to when I'm constantly trying to restrain myself from being reactive. Oh yeah. Amen. And I actually, I really liked that, that podcast you had with Ian. It was a really fun conversation, but totally. So I guess I should have mentioned that, you know, when I'm on Reddit, I also have stay focused running, which is a program that I have set for like 20 minutes a day. So I have 20 minutes between Twitter and Reddit each day that I can kind of scroll through and then it blocks me automatically. And so I used to have Facebook blocked, but I can't because of business. So I removed the time, my timeline, right? So the distracting part of Facebook is, you know, seeing all the stories in the center. I don't have that there anymore. How do you so yeah, do that? Shaping, it's this app called, oof, I can give you a link, okay, uh, yeah, people but it's a, it's just a plugin for Chrome and it's, yeah, man, it's, it's so good because you don't see there's, there, you know, the people that you actually care about that you hear about their life news in texts or emails or through another friend or family member. But yeah, most of the stuff on Facebook, especially around election time and all, you know, with politics as it is now, it's not informative and it's just really, it makes you lose respect for a lot of the people you, you like. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, dude, I think it's funny. So I've been off Facebook for a long time. I got back on for a, a reason. I needed to check something on something was going on with a buddy. But I got on the timeline and I was like, boy, these are people like I, I when I'm around them normally, like they're, they're these are great people. But then like, you see the stuff they post, you're like, man, I don't know if I like you people anymore. <laughs> so oh, like, yeah, completely. <laughs> <laughs> so I get that because I, I, I want to like these people because they're good people. No, I hear I hear you on that. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah, I'm I'm a hundred percent about you know shaping environments first before I even try to exert my willpower. You know, because I think my 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 level of willpower is even lower than most. <laughs> yeah. All right. So let's talk about this. You talk a little bit about this in the meditations on action is about probabilities. A lot of people, the reason why they don't take action. Or they think they're taking action, but they really are taking action. So they sit down, they plan things out, and they try to think of all the contingencies that could happen, the chances of these different contingencies happening. So they're basically trying to figure out how probable success is going to be, and if the probability is high, then they will take action. Do you think probabilities are useful to look at when deciding whether or not to take action? Yeah, this is a really good question. And I think statistics are getting you know more and more attention in the mainstream, which is, I think, really good. But we, as a general rule, we are terrible at predicting just about anything. You know, the best mathematicians, the, the smartest people in the world created systems that gave us probabilities that enabled actions that created the 2008 crisis, right? At least in part, right? There were incentives created primarily by bad probabilities. And so 
in our personal lives, we're really, really bad at, at knowing the probability of something. So especially the probability of success, because there's so many factors in success. So to answer your question more directly, I think there are certain domains in which probabilities are really useful, right? So in health, for instance, if there is just overwhelming evidence that says cigarettes will cause health issues, then you shouldn't probably smoke cigarettes. There's there's just a lot of a lot of evidence that's like there's, you know, 2% of people might live to 100 and smoke a cigarette every day, but 98% chance you're going to fail your body by smoking a cigarette. So there's also studies that say that 80% of restaurants fail within the first five years. That does not mean that if you start a restaurant, you have an 80% chance of failing because that is taking all restaurants into consideration. And regardless of, you know, we don't, we don't know what the economy was like at the time. We don't know anything about the people that started. I mean, restaurants tend to be started. There's a lot of people that are just think it would be this ideal life and it would be easy and fun to have a cafe when the reality of actually running a restaurant hits them, they fold. So it's taking into account just all sorts of things. That statistic knows nothing about your network, your skills, your level of grit and the current economic situation. So you may have an 80% chance of succeeding if you start a restaurant. Peter Thiel is a Silicon Valley investor, started PayPal, just very smart guy in most fronts. And he has this saying that is aimed at entrepreneurs. It says, you are not a lottery ticket. You don't start a business. And then once it's started, you have X percent chance of winning. You have a million decisions to make every day. You have decisions about how much energy you invest, how safe you play it, how hard you hustle for sales. A probability is you're never going to have a good probability. There's also another investor and ex- startup guy named Ben Horowitz, one of the co-founders of A16Z, and Dreesen Horowitz, a big venture capital fund, has a saying. He basically says, as a startup founder, your job is the same whether you have a 100% chance of success or a 1 in 1,000% chance of success. You have to find the path to winning, right? Yeah, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter your your chance of success. And so an example that I think kind of brings these two uses of probability together is shown in Edward Thorpe. This is a guy who he's run hedge funds for 20 years, but he got really famous for being the first guy to really he wrote the book Beat the Dealer, which is what inspired 21, all these blackjack movies and books. He used probabilities to beat the casino, right? So he used statistics and learning about probability to learn how to beat the house in the actual game of blackjack. But then in deciding his path and deciding whether or not he should try to beat the house in blackjack, he could not use probabilities because everybody thought it was impossible. This was in 1950s, early 1960s. Everybody told him it was impossible to beat the casino, right? Because otherwise, why would they exist? Why would they be so profitable? And he didn't even know his chance of success, right? He didn't consider the probability that he could beat Blackjack, but he used probability to beat the house. I love that. But really like the Peter Thiel quote, that you're not a lottery ticket. Yeah, right? It's it, empowering. You know, the sense of probability, and this is... Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I think what you were really getting at with the question is people use probability to rob themselves of agency in this world. They use a statistic as a reason to not try. And that is, in every case, baloney. You heard it here, it's baloney. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you also talk about how action has a sort of a magnetic effect. It creates things like passion and courage, right? Once you start taking action, you start building this momentum. But you even say it attracts forces bigger than ourselves. I mean, this sounds very much like Stephen Pressfield territory. Can you tell a little bit more about what you mean by action creating this magnetic effect? Absolutely. I think the whole action book, you know, the pocket guide to action was really inspired by Pressfield and some other people, but especially the format of the book. I almost see it now as like the positive to his resistance, right? Stephen Pressfield wrote in War of Art about the resistance describing it. And to me, action is focusing on the thing that overcomes it every time. Not saying that this is on the same level as Pressfield. 
But this idea, yeah, absolutely. At, at the end of, I think it is at the end of War of Art, he talks about, you know, how action essentially calls down the assistance of angels and mysterious creative forces. To me, you kind of witness it. It's the same idea that my mom was talking about when I was a kid, when she said, God helps those who help themselves. When people say, the more I work, the more lucky I become. So I think a big piece of this is that people respect those who take action and so are willing to help more often, right? So if you're confidently taking action, or if you're just consistently taking action with a certain aim, and you show grit, people will eventually begin to help you. And so a lot of times, these are the unseen forces, right? It's just people that saw you trying, who you didn't know saw you, who later show up with assistance. Another thing that kind of feels magic, but maybe isn't, is that action allows for emergence of new perspectives. In an article, I used the example of walking in New York City, right? So you're walking down this kind of grid of skyscrapers and around each corner, something new emerges and there's a pattern, right? You go past one building, you look to the left, there's just a bunch more buildings. But then eventually you walk past the skyscraper, you look to the left and then you see trees, you see Central Park, you see nature. So up until that, the previous 90 blocks of walking, you should be able to extrapolate out from that and predict okay, I'm just going to walk through skyscrapers the rest of my life. But no, now there's this whole new potential. And so the same thing happens when we're taking action. There's a possibility when we take action for an entire new perspective, for an entire new piece of knowledge that helps us move to the next level in a way that was impossible for us before because we just saw the world differently or we're missing this one piece of information. To me, those are just two examples of hidden benefits that happen when we take action that feel like they're coming from the outside. They feel like it's something bigger than us. And that's just me playing it safe. You know, there's a lot of things, anybody who is, you know, really gone for it, really committed to something, taking consistent action after it has noticed new powers within themselves, right? So inner commitment, action is proof to yourself that you are willing to do what it takes. And so a lot of the kind of self-defeating pieces of yourself fall away when you prove through action to yourself that you're going to keep moving, right? That also feels like, you know, the sky is opening up, the angels coming to assist you because parts of yourself that were not engaged before now are, right? It can absolutely feel like magic. That's awesome. Going back to things that keep people from taking action. We talk about probabilities, using statistics to stop taking action. You argue in the book that another thing people do that prevents them from taking action is asking questions, particularly bad questions, the time wasters that keep them from getting going and actually doing something. So what are some of these bad questions people waste their time on? These are all based in, you know, we're, we're taught that if there's a question, then there's an answer. And that may be true, but there's certain questions that I think break logic or that we expect too much from. And the four bad questions that I, I pose in the book belong to that category. So the first one being, am I happy? So I think happiness is something that is usually had obliquely. It's, it's something that kind of follows when we're taking action in a certain way. It's not something that we can look at, identify and say, okay, yeah, I've got it, right? Um, so I think that is a bad question that ends badly for most people. Another one that is answerable for a few people, but I don't think honestly is answerable for many at all is what is my purpose in life? And I hate to bring in Taleb again. <laughs> He's been a big force in this conversation, but he has this perfect quote that deals with this. He says, life is more about execution than purpose. And at first that seems kind of like sterile or, um, you know, afraid of, of purpose or something. But in my experience, the only true purpose that I've ever experienced has been when I'm dedicated to taking action, when I'm focused on the actions that I'm taking. There's that book, Start With Why. I think if you start with an abstract why, you're going to end up with a really beautiful mission statement or a really beautiful, you know, poetic vision of your life but it's not something that's going to hold up when you're trying to take action. It's not going to hold up when you're struggling, 
right? Because you can argue against a beautiful written abstract sense of purpose. True purpose to me is something that is felt and probably only only explained later. So another bad question is, do I love this person, right? And as soon as you try to answer that question, you're not loving them. Love is a verb in my view. And so once you start to answer that question, you're not taking the action of loving the person. You are separating from them and abstracting your relationship, which is a really easy way to talk yourself out of loving anybody. And then the fourth and probably the heaviest of them is why live? Like why stay alive? And Camus, Albert Camus even said, the only serious philosophical question is whether or not to commit suicide. If you want to take that challenge, you're going to be really frustrated. People have been doing it for thousands of years and coming up with a lot of different answers. And if you want to stick with logic, I don't think anybody has come up with an airtight answer. But that doesn't mean the question is relevant or hard to answer at all. It's just hard to answer in the abstract. When we pay attention to the actions we're taking, when we're taking earnest action, that question just can't exist, right? That's not a question (laughs) that anybody asks that's trying to do something. If you're in the middle of playing a game of football or or doing any kind of challenging task, you're never going to ask yourself, why even live? That only happens when you're living in a purely abstract place. So to me, action is always an obvious answer to the affirmative of that question. So like I said, all of those are just kind of this breed of questions that ask too much from logic and don't respect its limits. No, that question, what's my purpose in life? It made me think of Viktor Frankl. It's been a while since I've read Viktor Frankl, but then I forgot what I was listening to. It made me want to revisit. And I forgot like, that Frankl talked about this. He talked about like he thought that asking about what your purpose in life was, was a dumb question. He thought it didn't matter what we expected from life, but he said rather we should be focused on what life is expecting from us and then try to answer that question. That question is being asked to us daily, hourly. What's life? His answer wasn't, you know, you don't respond with talk and meditation, but it's right action, right conduct in order to answer that question that life is asking you, you know, what life is expecting from you at that moment, basically. Yeah. And it's never a romantic answer, right? Like it's never going to sound world changing. It's never going to sound like something that you want on your bio. It's going to be something really simple, really specific probably, but it's going to carry a lot of weight. And that, and that question can be like, my purpose right now is to help my crying kid who's being really annoying. I'm going to do this thing, get it done, but like be patient and calm in the process. Like that's that thing. It's, it's very grounded in action. Amen. You also say that action both makes things harder and easier. The way we've been talking about action makes it sound like, oh, just opens these doors. You get these creative forces that come help you. You develop passion by taking action, but how can action make things harder as well. There's a trade-off here, and I think it's one worth making. A lot of times people say, well, here's an answer, and it's like, obviously easier, and, and everything will work out if you take this stance. I think what we're talking about, there's a whole host of benefits that make focusing on taking action worthwhile, but it also, I think, makes life significantly more difficult because you end up taking on more challenges, which means you end up taking on bigger challenges, right? So once you face the things that are immediately in front of you, your problems don't usually get smaller. They tend to get larger in scope. You're just growing enough to handle them. So you're dealing with more pressing situations and putting more skin in the game, right? So when you're taking more action, when you're focused on action, you generally have more immediately at risk. So your skin's in the game and you're engaged probably in some version of the strenuous life that that you wrote recently really beautifully about your article on, on the strenuous life i think in a lot of ways talks about the harder aspects of a life of action and so you're under more strain you're under more pressure you're more committed right but you're more engaged you're more alive you're more virile um, but life also becomes easier So as you take on these bigger challenges, as you're more engaged and pushing against more things, that means that you're not ruminating, right? You're not leaving as much space 
to drain yourself of energy while talking yourself in circles. You're not justifying your decisions or your life to people who don't matter. You're acting, I think, more in line with nature because you get out of your head and into reality where there's ties between actions and consequences. You're not breaking yourself to fit into a mold or checking off boxes that you think you're supposed to. You're becoming more self-reliant, I would say. So, you know, things get harder, I would say physically, not strictly physically, but they get harder and there's more strain, probably there's more pressure, but easier. And that more of that strain, more of that pressure is coming from the outside, coming from challenging situations you're putting yourself in and less self-harm and kind of less respect for obligations or invisible obligations that society might be putting on you. I love it. Well, Kyle, there's a lot more we can talk about. The Pocket Guide for Action is available for pre-order, The Art of Manliness store. It's pretty cool. Both Kyle and I have been working on this thing for months. We've, we've self-published this thing. And that was some action that was hard, as Kyle can uh, <laughs> attest to it. But uh, we learned a lot in the process, but it, it turned out really great and we're really excited about it. So you can buy that on the Art of Manly store. But Kyle, you've also set up sort of a accompanying online course that people can take with the Pocket Guide to Action, right? Yes. You can see some of the details at theactioncourse.com. It's also, you know, the URLs in the book think on the book page, it takes the ideas from the pocket guide to action and puts them in practices that you can apply immediately. So there's about 20 lessons that have, you know, five to 20 minute practices that will help you kickstart this perspective of this habit of taking action. Awesome. Love it. Well, Kyle Eschenroder, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Thanks a lot, Brett. My guest today was Kyle Eschenroder. He's the author of The Pocket Guide to Action, 116 Meditations on the Art of Doing. It's available at the Art of Manliness store at store.artofmanliness.com. You can also find more information about Kyle's work at kyleeschen.com. That's K-Y-L-E-S-C-H-E-N.com. And also you can check out our show notes at aom.is slash action, where you can find links to resources where you can delve deeper into this topic. 